Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. We're back here at Spawn today because today we're going to tackle something incredibly fundamental, but something which is going to change the way we can live in this world. Now, I have been holding on to my Elytra for a while and a bunch of people in the comments and on streams and so forth have asked me, why aren't you using the Elytra a lot more? Well, the simple answer to that is that I don't have a great supply of rockets and I don't feel like spending all of my nights chasing down creepers around here in order to get gunpowder. But today, that is going to change, because we are going to make our first mob farm. A general, hostile mob farm that takes advantage of the game's natural spawning mechanics and uses them to the player's advantage. And before we get started with this tutorial, I will remind you that unfortunately, this kind of farm isn't going to work as effectively in Bedrock Edition, because one of the major differences between Bedrock Edition and Java Edition is in how they spawn mobs. As far as as light goes, basically both versions work roughly the same. If you have a light source nearby, hostile mobs will not spawn when it gets dark because that light source is providing light to the surrounding environment, and in the overworld at least, mobs will only spawn in complete darkness. But Bedrock Edition also has rules about how many mobs can spawn in a certain area, how frequently they spawn, and various other bits and pieces, which Java does not. And so a lot of the time on Java Edition you'll find players taking advantage of being able to spawn lots lots of mobs in a very small area, which is more or less what we're going to do today. We're going to need to gather a large amount of blocks, which in this case I think I'm probably going to use dark oak wood because I've gathered a huge amount of that over the course of a couple of tree farming live streams. We're going to need a bunch of redstone components, namely hoppers, observers, and dispensers. And before we do anything else, we're going to have a brief talk about soul fire. Normally when you make a torch in your crafting interface, you just put a stick and a piece of coal like so. It can be made in a 2x2 crafting interface but the reason I've got this open in the crafting table is if we put a block of soul soil underneath that, it turns into soul torches. Soul torches are a little bit different to regular torches. They give off less light level. They'll actually give off a light level of 10 from a single torch, which means they don't melt snow layers when they're around. As you can see, the tip of the torch and the flame burn blue instead of an orangey red. And piglins here in the Crimson Forest biome are actually scared of soul fire. They'll run away from soul torches. Likewise, they'll run away from any soul fire that you light on nearby soul soul soil blocks, they just don't like the stuff. The same is true of soul lanterns, which can be crafted the same way as a regular lantern except with a soul torch and they will burn with a blue flame. And last of all, substituting the piece of coal for a piece of soul soil in the campfire recipe will get you soul campfires. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today, because the cool thing about soul campfires is they will deal twice the amount of damage as regular campfires, which make them pretty ideal actually for killing mechanisms in mob farms. While a regular campfire will deal half a heart of damage every time it damages you a soul campfire will deal a full heart of damage every time it damages you, which means when we need them to literally burn through mobs in the case of the mob farm we're going to make today, soul campfires are twice as fast. So now we've got that explanation taken care of, we need to figure out where exactly we are planning to build a mob farm, and then we'll talk a bit more about the design. But the location of a mob farm is very important. In Java Edition, mobs can spawn in a 128 block radius around the player, so 128 blocks in every direction from us a mob has the potential to spawn, as long as the conditions are right, as long as there isn't too much light in the area, as long as it is dark enough. Give or take a radius of 24 blocks around the player, or I think 23, but it probably includes the block you're standing on as well, in which mobs cannot spawn. Basically, mobs can't spawn too close to the player, otherwise a creeper could just spawn next to you and you wouldn't have any time to react to it. Outside of that, there is a radius of 32 blocks, beyond which mobs' AI starts to act less. Regardless of what your simulation distance is set to, the mobs will tend to freeze in place unless they are zombies which track towards the player from a longer distance, but you'll typically find that most mobs don't do a whole lot of moving around if they're 32 blocks away from the player. Between 32 blocks and 128 blocks away from the player, mobs also have a chance to randomly despawn, which won't happen instantly, but once you get more than 128 blocks away from a hostile mob, they will despawn. Now we're talking about hostile mobs pretty much exclusively here. When it comes to passive mobs, sheep, cows, other animals, that kind of stuff, all 
of those have similar spawning conditions to mobs, give or take the darkness aspect, but they don't tend to despawn in Java Edition, with some exceptions like squid and fish because they're constantly moving and there's a chance that they might take up a lot of the game's resources. But that 128 block radius is very important because if we're standing here at sea level, for example, at Y63, there is 128 blocks of vertical space between us and the bedrock floor at the bottom of the world. So basically anywhere underneath us at this point, mobs could be spawning in dark areas that we just don't know about. So underneath us, mobs are spawning and despawning in caves pretty much all the time, we just can't see them doing it. And once it gets to night time, we'll find that a bunch of mobs start to spawn on the surface because there's a lot of dark area around here, and as the player runs around, mobs in those caves will be despawning and freeing up spaces in what's called the mob cap, the total number of hostile mobs that can appear in the world at any one time. In order for us to farm hostile mobs most effectively, in order for us to get a bunch of hostile mobs to spawn in one place and then set up an easy way to kill them, we basically need to make sure all of the mobs can spawn in one area. We want one dark area away from any other spawnable spaces in the world. Or rather, we want to manipulate the game so that the player is standing far enough away from any other spawnable spaces in the world that there is only really one place or a series of places in which mobs can spawn. Which is why when it comes to mob farms, the simplest, the most straightforward place to build them is over a large area of ocean, like this one. This is an almost perfectly circular area of ocean that I think is going to provide a really nice perimeter for our starting mob farm design. Now the other thing you should know about mob spawning in Java Edition, which once again is not the case in Bedrock Edition, is that mob spawning gets more and more efficient the further down in the world you are. So spawn rates at the bottom of the world are multiple times as fast as they are further up in the world. Because of the way the game calculates these things, it sort of figures stuff out from the bottom of the world upwards. And so in terms of spawning efficiency, the most effective thing we could do is build the farm at the very bottom of the world as close to bedrock as possible. However, that would require a huge amount of work in order to spawn proof, light up, destroy whatever we wanted to do, all of the caves in the surrounding area for a 128 block radius. That's also now twice as deep as it used to be in older worlds. It is honestly a huge, staggeringly large amount of work, especially for the stage of the game that we're at right now. So at this point, we have to compromise. We need to build our farm as low down in the world as we can, but we don't want to spend a bunch of time removing terrain, lighting stuff up, all kinds of other stuff. So we're going to build our farm at sea level around here. And then in order to make sure that we aren't standing near any other spawnable blocks, which include blocks of the ocean because the drowned can spawn down here, we're going to set it up so the point where we can stand and step away from the computer and allow mobs to spawn and accumulate and die about 100 blocks up in the sky. In total, it will be 128 blocks up in the sky, but the farm is going to be relatively tall and we'll build a scaffold up from the roof that we can stand on and use as our AFK point, our point where we're away from the keyboard, just letting mobs do their thing in the farm. So let's get to building. The first thing we're going to do is find roughly the center of this area, and it doesn't need to be the exact center because, honestly, there is enough of a radius of water around this that I don't think we're going to cause any mobs to spawn if we're high up enough in the air. The spawning range around the player is actually a sphere, so if you take a 128 block radius directly from where the player is standing, most of the time it will kind of round off at the bottom here, and we won't have to worry about too much stuff spawning around the periphery. So I think here, on top of this kelp plant is probably where we're going to start our mob farm. Having set up this 3x3 platform here that's going to be our base of operations, we're actually going to pillar up a few blocks from this and maybe go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 before we start building the farm itself, because I want to leave enough room down here for an automatic sorting system that's going to sort out all of the mob drops we get, collect the bones, put them in a separate chest to the gunpowder and the string and the spider eyes and all of the other stuff that we'll be getting from the natural mob spawns in the area. So we'll create a 3x3 platform up here. Above that, we're going to put in three chests, which will eventually be the filter chests that sort everything else into their component categories. We're going to put a bunch of hoppers facing into these, and we're going to create another 3x3 of hoppers. <laughs> On top of these will go the soul campfires. This is what's going to be killing the mobs as they make their way down into this bottom part of the farm. And around the outside of those, we are going to arrange a bunch of planks so that the mob 
mobs filter down into this area with nowhere else to go. If you want to have access to those chests while the campfires are on top of them, I recommend adding in some stairs or slabs here just so that you can still open the chests while closing off this area with the soul campfires. And remember, you can always extinguish a campfire with a shovel and relight it with flint and steel just in case you fall into this thing. Don't want you taking so much damage that you end up dying. Above this area, we're going to make our first large scale platform. And this is going to be where water streams will direct all of the mobs down into these campfires. We're going to come out seven blocks from each side of this so that each stretch of this platform is eight blocks long which will allow a full water stream to carry the mobs over here and tip them into the pit with the campfires. Once we have these seven block arms we'll simply connect those up at the corners here. And if you want to save on materials, this doesn't have to be a square, it can be an octagon, you can kind of round the corners off here as we'll see a little bit later, but making it a square makes it a little bit simpler to place all of the water streams correctly. So we're going to start with this design, we can always refine it later. Now we're going to fill in the center of each of these platforms, you can do this with whatever materials you want to, these don't even have to be solid blocks because these are the ones that are just going to be channeling the water streams. I usually make these out of full planks because you can get four of them out of a log block and they're a little bit easier to place than slabs are. You don't have to be quite as precise with how you connect them. But naturally, if you want to save on materials, then you can build this out of slabs. It doesn't really matter. Now that we have our platform in place, we're going to place a block at each of the four corners. And from there around the outside of the platform, we're going to place another row of blocks, one block up from that, just to make sure that the water stays in the farm. Now I'm going to dip down to the ocean and grab a second bucket of water, which is another great reason to build one of these things in an ocean. And we can start to fill in water sources around the outside of the platform here, making sure that we skip these two corner blocks because we're going to place a water source on top of that which is going to flow down into the farm from each corner. Placing water sources all the way around the rim on each side of the farm and then one flowing inwards from each corner block on here creates a set of water streams kind of similar to how we set up our cave spider spawner farm a while ago where anything dropped into this whether it's a mob or an item will always end up going directly into the center. Now since we built this outer rail out of solid blocks we will need to spawn proof these and we're going to spawn proof them using slabs because if we put any light around here we risk compromising the light level in the inside of the farm which is going to need to be in complete darkness for mobs to spawn. So we're going to take some time to cover this outer rail in slabs just to make sure that nothing is spawning over here. So we're going to take some time to cover this outer rail in slabs just to make sure the whole thing is spawn proof. And now from above our mob farm looks like this. A tray of water directing everything into that central killing area. And it drips a lot from the underneath <laughs> so if you find that uncomfortable you might want to slab the bottom half of this or add in a different layer of material just to make sure that the whole thing doesn't feel like it's raining on you while you're using the farm. Now this is the point at which it's really going to help to have some scaffolding because we're going to want to make a couple of platforms here and we'll need easy ways to get up and down between them. As close as possible to the center here we're going to build up a tower of scaffolding, we're going to build it one more block up here and this is where we're going to start our platforms. Now we can once again make these out of slabs if we want to conserve materials. The important thing is that you make sure these are top half slabs and not bottom half slabs because bottom half slabs are of course not spawnable as we covered in the episode about spawn proofing. So it's pretty important to make sure that those stay on the top half if you want to conserve materials and use those for the farm. In my case though I am just going to use solid blocks because I find them easier to work with and I've got enough wood that I can spare the resources. So we need to take note of our central block here which is directly over this campfire and from that block we need to go out seven blocks in each direction. If you counted this right you're going to have two blocks worth of space between the end of this platform and the outer rail of the platform below. And instead of squaring these platforms off like we did with the one below, we're going to be building these into effectively a diamond shape. With the idea here being that if we place a water bucket directly on the center of this platform, it's going to flow to the very edges without any of the water flowing off and interfering with the water down below. And while hostile mobs naturally won't spawn in water, we're going to have the water dispensed and retracted from a dispenser in the center of each of the platforms we're going to be building here, this one and the ones above it. The dispenser is going to be facing upwards, we can put a water bucket in there, and now anytime this receives redstone power, it's going to flush this platform, all the mobs will fall off the edges, and they'll go in towards the center where they'll die in the campfires. Two blocks above this dispenser, we're going to place an observer facing upwards like so, so it will be looking at the next dispenser, and when it detects that that dispenser fires, 
it will flush this platform for us. Just for the sake of my own sanity, I'm going to remove the buckets from these dispensers for now, just so we don't have to deal with the platforms flushing and not flushing in the meantime. And right here, we're going to start building our next platform up. And we're going to do this five or six more times, so that we end up with about seven or eight platforms all stacked on top of each other. These platforms are two blocks high, which will allow for the majority of hostile mobs that spawn in the overworld to spawn on these platforms. The exception would be Endermen, which require a three block high area in order to spawn. But since Endermen teleport away when they come into contact with water, this wouldn't be a very effective Enderman farm anyway. But in the meantime, all of the other mobs like skeletons, zombies, creepers, even witches will be flushed out of this farm and down into the campfires. Unfortunately, the witches won't be killed by the campfires because witches have the ability to drink a fire resistance potion that makes them immune to fire damage, which unfortunately includes the damage that they will take from campfires. It also includes the damage from lava and various other things that we could use to kill these mobs. If you wanted this farm to kill witches as well, you could simply change the kill mechanism for it. Witches have a higher amount of HP than most mobs, but they still won't survive a fall of, I believe, about 30 blocks. And if you wanted to, you could place some pointed drips stone at the bottom of your kill mechanism which would multiply the damage they take from falling onto it. In the process of that I think you do risk a couple of the mob drops lingering on top of the hitboxes of the pointed dripstone instead of dropping down into the collection mechanism so you might need to figure out something using hopper minecarts to collect those drops that might end up getting stuck on top of the pointed dripstone. In my case I'm not too worried about that. We're going to kill witches via a different system elsewhere in the world because eventually we're going to want to make a witch hut farm which will only spawn witches and which will be able to harvest drops from witches in larger amounts. And since our AFK platform for this farm is going to be 128 blocks above the lowest point in the farm, then the witches are probably going to despawn from that 32 block radius of despawning anyway. So even if they stay alive, the witches aren't going to hold up the farm for very long because they'll just despawn eventually. At this point, our farm is going to look like this. A series of platforms which right now are not spawning anything, because if we step into the center of the farm here, this is not nearly dark enough. It's currently at light level 8, just from the sky, although obviously there is no block light around. The farm would function perfectly well at night like this, but we are going to need to make sure that the farm is completely dark on the inside the rest of the time. And there are a couple of different approaches we can take to this. The most typical is to build a large roof over the outside of it, which blocks the light from the sky even during the day. Unfortunately, of course, to reach the outer limits of the farm, like this tip of this platform right here, or the tip of the platforms below, it is going to have to be quite expansive. It's going to have to basically travel 15 blocks away from this just to make sure we don't end up with any light filtering in. And it also helps to make that platform out of non-solid blocks like slabs just so that the game doesn't think there is another layer above this that it can attempt to spawn mobs. So our final observer right here is actually going to be embedded in a platform of slabs. And these will be lower half slabs just to make sure that they don't spawn anything and also so that they still provide two blocks worth of headroom for the farm below. Another option we have is to completely surround the farm in tinted glass or some other kind of solid block. I would favor tinted glass because we'd be able to see through it into the inner workings of the farm and make sure that the farm was flushing correctly and still producing mobs. But of course, when this farm is in operation, we're mostly going to be standing a whole bunch of blocks up in the air, so we won't really get to see a great angle on that anyway. I also think at this point in the game, it's just going to be cheaper to build the entire roof out of slabs because I have so much wood available to me, whereas tinted glass takes a while to farm and we need enough of it for a large enough scale farm like this that I do need to wait a little while longer for my amethyst in my geodes to grow. So I am sorry to tell you that this is how far out we need to build the roof of this farm, at least for now. We might end up making some adjustments to it later just to make things a little more aesthetically pleasing, but for now at least we're going to be building the platform all the way out to here, and all the way out to here, and all the way out to here, and finally all the way out to here, so 15 blocks from every single corner of the platform, and then square it off on all sides. But before we completely darken the farm and make this problem even worse for ourselves, we need to come through, remove the scaffolding, add the water buckets into each of these dispensers and think about how we're going to activate them. Luckily for us, activating all of those dispensers is going to be very simple from up here because we've left ourselves an observer that's going to trigger the entire thing. When we do anything at all to this observer, as you can hear, a couple of dispensers tick and they've actually ticked all the way down these platforms so that if we place water buckets in each of the dispensers, we can flush 
all of the platforms simultaneously. Or if we want to, we can have them flush alternately. We can have one platform flush while the other one retracts the water and so on and so forth down the line. And that will make sure that there are always mobs spawning when one platform is flushing, the next one will be spawning mobs potentially. But we don't need to worry too much about that. I think it's gonna produce roughly the same results regardless. We're gonna activate this entire system by activating a note block up here. It's gonna simply play a note. That's gonna activate all of the observers going down into the rest of the farm. And that is going to be activated by a simple redstone clock that was invented by a very well-known guy called Etho. The majority of the community thinks of this as an Etho hopper clock. It's going to be activating this observer right here, which will activate a single piece of redstone dust powering this note block. Now, when we do anything in front of this observer, it activates all of the dispensers on the platforms below, and we take the block away, does exactly the same thing. That's going to be monitoring this redstone block being shuttled back and forth between two sticky pistons. We're going to place one of those there, we're going to place the other one here. Each of these is going to be powered by a piece of cobblestone either side, which is going to pick up a redstone signal from an adjacent diagonal block. That redstone dust is going to be powered by a comparator, one facing that way and one facing that way, and those are going to be detecting the contents of two hoppers that we're going to be placing facing into each other like so. We break one, replace it so that both of the outputs are connected to each other. Looking at that, I think I've done it slightly wrong. We need to have one piece of cobblestone there and a piece there. Okay, so we can close that back up. We need to have a redstone dust on that one. Yes, there we go. So that the comparator signal goes into this block which powers that redstone dust. If it was the other way around, the redstone dust was just coming out of a comparator in a line and it wasn't going to activate this piston, but hopefully now it should. So in a second, we'll get another piece of redstone dust to put here. But in the meantime, I will show you how this mechanism works. Effectively, the redstone stone block here is going to be locking one of these hoppers each time so that when we put some items in here they do not leave this hopper. The output of this hopper is locked and it's not going to be pushing any items into here. But the comparator is going to detect that this hopper has some items in it. When it does that it's going to send a redstone signal to this block here which is going to power some redstone dust which will activate this piston. I can show you that right now just by moving the redstone dust over here like so. And when that happens, it's going to eject all of the items from that hopper into the other one. And now it's going to cause a redstone clock to happen because I don't have a second piece of redstone dust. Here we go. I actually went and got some redstone dust this time so that I can show you what happens. So we've taken the lever away that was locking that piston and you'll see that the redstone block shuttles back and forth because as soon as the items leave one hopper, the piston on this side is going to activate as the other one deactivates and that's going to allow the redstone block to shuttle back and forth. It will only pulse that redstone once, which means all of the dispensers get activated once and they all flush their platforms with water. If we want to turn the clock off at any time, we can do that simply by placing a lever against one of these and that will activate this redstone dust permanently if we switch it on, locking this piston in place and then the clock will stay stable and that lever now effectively acts as an on off switch for this clock. The other thing we've done here is create a bunch of solid blocks that mobs could spawn on. Observers, cobblestone blocks, the pistons, the redstone block, each of these is a spawnable block which could spawn mobs at night so we will need to make sure that each of these is slabbed over with a bottom half slab to make sure that they are spawn proofed. Alternatively we could just place a torch here. <laughs> but now the only thing that is left to do is go and collect some water sources either from the ocean or from just down here in our water tray and we're going to fill up each of the dispensers in these platforms with water. I put water on half the platforms for now we're going to switch this lever off and we'll switch one on at the other end of the clock and that has flushed alternating platforms down here allowing us to go in and put water buckets in the ones that have remained dry. We've also got to make sure that I remove any temporary scaffolding from in here and with that the farm should be complete and we'll now alternate platforms every time that hopper clock switches. We can also control how long it takes the hopper clock to switch back and forth by changing the amount of items in here so it will count down for longer. I think I'm going to put 32 blocks of cobblestone in here as the starter amount for our clock and we can adjust that if we want to here and there depending on whether or not it feels like the farm is filling up with mobs before it flushes the platforms. But now if we remove the lever from this side and the other side of the farm remains off, you can see that the platforms that didn't have water on are now flushing. Back on one of the open arms of this thing, we can take a look at it from a distance and you've got to make sure that there's enough time for the platforms to dry out entirely and allow mobs to build up in there before they flush the next time and allow all of the mobs to be thrown off. There is some wisdom to having all of these platforms flushing at once because if the other platforms have 
generated enough mobs that they take up the entire mob cap, having some dry platform still in here is not going to matter until those mobs end up getting killed in the campfires. I'm not sure which method I want to set this up with really, so let me know in the comments what your preferred method is and we'll see if we can come to some sort of consensus. I have one last piece of scaffolding to take out from down here by the campfires and this should now be a fully functional mob farm. All we have to do is darken the farm by continuing to build out the roof and defend ourselves from this drown down here who seems to be trying to throw tridents at me. You're not part of the farm, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to save you for later. Yeah, it looks like he's getting a little closer now. I should probably be worried. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to fly back up here and continue placing slabs for the roof of this farm so that hopefully the entire interior of the farm can be dark. And once it's done, this thing should be spawning mobs like nobody's business. Well, with the roof all done, all that was left was to determine what our AFK point should be. And for that, I took the coordinates of the bottom part of this tray here, which was about roughly, I think, Y71. And I just added about 120 blocks to that. So we're up here at Y195 right now, meaning that the lowest point in the farm, the area where the mobs end up dying on those campfires, is roughly 126, 127 blocks below us. You don't want to go the full 128 because more often than not that means some of the mobs would end up despawning when they go slightly outside of that radius. So up here on the top of the world we can set up a little AFK box for ourselves so that we can stand up here safely without phantoms interfering with us from the sky if it gets dark, without lightning striking us, and we might even want to put a lightning rod somewhere nearby so that lightning doesn't strike and set fire to the slab roof down below us. And coming down to the collection mechanism here, we definitely get a picture of how well this farm is working because we can hear all sorts of mobs dying in here as we stand underneath it. I'm going to expand each one of these chests. We're not going to attach the storage system to it quite yet, but I am going to grab all of the drops out of these chests and from here we're going to spend an hour standing AFK on top of this farm. Just from putting the roof on and spending a little bit of time figuring out the AFK point, it's given us enough gunpowder, bones, arrows and string that we can safely assume that the farm is working pretty well. And now for a quick final check we'll make sure that the clock up here is working, which it is, we'll go halfway up this tower. We'll come out as far as a scaffolding bridge will allow us to, out to about there. We'll place some calcite and we'll put a lightning rod on top of that because that will allow us to divert any lightning that would be striking the farm onto whatever that block is and have no harm done. Eventually we might make a more permanent AFK platform up here that's going to look a little nicer than this tower of scaffolding, but part of the plan here is not to use so many fireworks in getting up here in the first place. We'll make sure we turn each of these chests into double chests, just so we have enough there. And as we climb up into our little AFK box in the sky, I'm going to put a timer on for an hour, go make a cup of tea, do the dishes, come back and see how many mob drops we have acquired. Okay, time for the moment of truth. Let's see how many drops this farm has produced while we've been AFK for an hour. I'm just going to stand up here on this ledge because I haven't really formalized the sorting system yet. And that's looking pretty solid. That's almost a full double chest in each of these. It looks like we have a little bit less in the central chest as we have the ones on around the outside, which makes sense because the things are probably falling around the outside of the farm instead of directly into the center, but that's looking pretty solid if you ask me. Let's grab all of the gunpowder out of this, and I think that's going to fill up the rest of the spots in my inventory and then some. I'll throw some into this amethyst box that I was gathering from another geode on a live stream, but I'm pretty sure we're going to fill up that and my inventory as well. Yes, we have a lot of gunpowder right now. <laughs> That's looking very, very nice. Let me slip another piece of calcite in there and we can head over to our storage system. So down here in the storage system, I've designated this chest for gunpowder. The ones on the end here are going to be the mob drops and it looks like we're going to probably fill up this double chest within a couple more AFK sessions. It's really not looking too shabby, is it? And now we can grab maybe a couple of stacks of this. We'll head over to the sugarcane farm that we've had working here since the early days of the world. Let's grab a few stacks of that and we can make ourselves fireworks for days. There we go, that's our first row of a shulker box all filled up and we can make this a dedicated fireworks box. We're going to stick that in our ender chest and we can use that to fly across the world with. Now while naturally the drops from this farm aren't going to provide absolutely everything we could possibly get from these mobs, it doesn't count armor, it doesn't count things like the rare drops you get from zombies, the iron ingots, the carrots and potatoes, the things that you only get by actively killing those mobs yourself. But it is going to supply us with a bunch of rotten flesh that we could 
trade to clerics. We've got a ton of bones in here that we could use for bone meal or craft into bone blocks. All the arrows we could ever want. A handful of string as well, which we can craft into wool or use for various other things. And these drops are just an infinite supply. They're going to keep coming every time we AFK here at this farm. This is only the beginning of our adventures with mob farm mechanics, but I think they've started off pretty well. And that's where we're going to wrap it up for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this look at mob farming and good luck if you decide to build one of these farms in your own survival world. I'll leave a link to a couple of people who originated these farms in the description, specifically the folks like Nembon and Ilmango who really put the work in to optimize these farm designs in recent memory. But there are a ton of different farm designs out there that I highly recommend giving a look if you're interested in doing a bit more of this. For now, that's going to be it from me. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.